I think. Hi, Vidette. Welcome. Hi. <laughs> Okay, I'm still trying to figure out Zoom here myself. It is uh, it is 5:20, and we uh, we now have a quorum, so we'll call this meeting to order. And Nicole, if you would uh, do roll call. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, Director Starkey. Here. Director Smith. Here. Director Roberts. Here. Chairman Short. Here. Thank you for that. And um, yeah. I see no flag in our on our screen. So we will dispense with the flag salute today and move right into public comment. We have any. Uh, I, was not, I, I was not notified of any public comment by the county. No. OK. Then uh, we will move on. We don't have anything on consent calendar, so we'll move on to the approval of the minutes of the June 9th uh, RCTA board meeting. Are there any deletions, corrections to the, the meeting minutes that anybody has discovered? I'll make a motion that we approve the minutes from the June 9th, 2021 RCTA board meeting. Thank you. We've got a motion to accept the minutes as printed I'll, I'll second and we got vedette has seconded um and if i'm not mistaken we have no public other than tamra is she's really good public just she is she's excellent public i i appreciate her being here all the time um so with that um we'll open in uh and close public comment as far as the meeting minutes go. And um, uh, Nicole, if you would pull the vote. Director Roberts? Uh, yes. Director Smith? Yes. Director Starkey? Yes. Chairman Short? Yes. OK. Um, We'll move on to item six, transit maintenance and operations contract and discussion of extension versus uh, new contract. Joe. All right, thank you, Chair Short, appreciate it. Um, this item um, is a discussion only strategy item. Um, right now, um, as you know, Redwood Coast Transit is a privatized transit uh, agency, so um, all of our um, employees here on the ground in Crescent City are employees of a contractor. Um, it's First Transit has is, is our, been our contractor for many years, and they're currently, we're in year five of a five-year base contract that does include two one-year options uh, that can be exercised at the end. Um, the, uh, so we're, if, we, if we do not execute a, a contract extension option, we will need to prepare a new RFP and do a full procurement uh, later this year. Uh, the current contract ends December 31st, 2021. Um, one of the issues we're grappling with, and it has been for a while, is um, our, our pay scale here of our, for our contractor. Um, the current contract um, started in January of 17, uh, right about when the California minimum wage uh, started ratcheting up at a rate of $1 per year. So while the current contract does technically comply with that, um, one of the things that's happened is the veteran employees that were here before that used to be, um, you know, notably above minimum wage, say, you know, two, three, four, five dollars an hour above at the time the minimum wage began to increase, um, they weren't kept whole as far as delta between minimum wage and and their salary so a lot of them are finding themselves just a little above minimum now and we're starting to um we're fearing that we're going to lose um bus drivers to competing uh local interests um such as uh service industry and walmart and stuff that are uh, hiring uh, above what, what our hiring starting wage is um 
we have during when the pandemic started, we added a two dollar an hour crisis pay that's still in place. It's been very helpful. Um, but that's a, even with that, uh, the situation as I previously described is the case. Um, so we, uh, one of the options or, or what we're contemplating is how do we, um, how can we address the, uh, the pay scale issues that we have so that we have uh, better, uh, lower turnover and better morale uh, and more wages that are more appropriate for the level of skill and trust and responsibility that our employees have. So on page two of your staff report, um, Mark and Mark Elias is with us here, the regional vice president for First Transit. Um, I asked Mark to, you know, when we begin talking about the wages, I asked them to do an analysis of our labor force and what the uh, what they feel the, the wage scale ranges should be. So that's included. I don't want to read it verbatim for you, but you can see those on page two in the italics. Those are um, the information Mark provided to us. Um, it's, it's noteworthy that pretty much every class of position within our contract here at uh, the Crescent City First Transit contract for RCTA is, is, is paid insufficiently at this point. So uh, in the information, if you total up that, I did want to note he was projecting our original uh, five, four, four or five years ago, we were running 20,000 hours. Um, and he put 22,000 hours here in the quote. Um, but due to the pandemic, we're not running nearly that many now. We're uh, assuming we reinstate the service that we want to reinstate this year, which is coming up in a couple items later, uh, we'll be around 16,000 annual hours. So we did reduce quite a bit. Uh, but still, uh, to, even at 16,000 hours to reach the pay scale that Mark recommends here for stability, um, it's probably in the range of 100,000 or a little over 100,000 a year of increased cost. Um, our perspective on that is um, due to different factors. We were proactive in cutting service right when the pandemic started. The federal government's been very generous in their intervention to support us and all transit agencies in the U.S. So, and uh, the amazing thing is that our local sales tax, our, our TDA uh, LTF fund has not fallen. In fact, it's projected to be at its highest ever uh, according to, to the TDA claim that we're doing this afternoon. So um, we probably can afford to support a wage intervention. intervention excuse me. Um, so then we had an interesting call before I go through the options. I did note at the start of the staff report um, that we had a call scheduled with Caltrans Procurement. They have the approval authority over anything we do on a major contract, uh, like a new RFP or even an extension of an existing contract. So we can't do anything without their approval. And if some of you, maybe Darren might remember about five years ago, there was a problem when we went ahead with a um, predecessor staff just ahead of me, Mark uh, and the board at the time back in 2015 and First Transit had uh, went through this process and negotiated an intervention to raise everyone's wages up and Caltrans killed it. They rejected the, uh, the amendment, they wouldn't do it. So we wanna make sure that we bring them along from the very get go this time. So we had a call with them today and uh, it was very fruitful. Um, their, their direction was pretty clear that they felt the best way to do it was to do a new RFP and just include the wage scale that we want for these positions that we feel is necessary in there so that all bidders would be bidding the same thing. Uh, they felt that that was a way to, to accomplish those, the goals we were talking about with, and still maintain a fair and competitive bidding process. So that's new news. We, we provide three options here, but uh, clearly Caltrans prefers to see the option, which is number three here, which is prepare and execute a new request for proposals and a brand new contract uh, between now and the end of the year. So um, that's the update. And I'd like to take any questions. Uh, Mark's here to talk about his analysis uh, of the classifications and their current pay and their, and their optimal pay ranges. So Mark, if you want to add anything, or we can just take questions from the board, whichever, you, whatever you guys feel is the most appropriate. Go ahead, yeah, Mark, if you, if you have any questions or have any comments. Sure, I, I, I appreciate the time. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so just a few thoughts on what Joe um, was speaking about in terms of the overall dollars and impacts. What I provided was just a guesstimate, of course. Um, and when you're looking at 22,000 hours, 
I was also including that that's payroll hours, not just revenue hours. So, you know, we're on, on much of our work, we're paid first pick up to last drop. Uh, we obviously have extra training we need to do with employees and um, other hours in addition to just revenue hours that we pay people for. So it is going to be a higher overall payroll number than just revenue number in terms of the hours that, you know, are calculated into overall cost. Um, and then Joe mentioned minimum wage and many of you may or may not be familiar with the minimum wage law regarding mechanics um, in the state of California which essentially requires us to pay double the minimum wage um, for any mechanic that provides their own tools. And of course, you know, we're a, we're a one person shop um, there in Crescent City, um, have a very talented maintenance manager, but also technician who definitely supplies his own tools. And so, um, you know, our employees looking at this law and saying, well, the minimum wage for my skill level is uh, 30 bucks an hour. And I'm way beyond that in terms of skill of an entry level technician that's only making 30 bucks an hour. Um, so, you know, adding another, yet another outside influence or cost influence upon, um, you know, running the business there. So you, we're not going to get a, a mechanic of any sort for less than $30 an hour starting January 1st, um, because that's twice the minimum wage. Um, so just something else to think about for that position. Um, and then if you just look at increasing the driver wages, like Fernando had just told me that the starting, that Walmart was hiring brand new employees at $17 an hour. Um, you know, we're looking at hiring professional operators with a CDL. Um, so a commercial driver's license to transport passengers um, at all times of day. Um, all days of the week. I mean, it's a much, much more challenging job in my humble opinion. Um, and uh, right now we're struggling just to hire people at 16 um, and uh, very, very challenging. So, um, you know, I, I put out there a, a suggested new starting rate of 18, I think for drivers, I think that's a minimum floor to look at folks um, in terms of when we're having this discussion. And then when you're paying, a, you know, a driver brand new in the door, um, 18 or $19 an hour starting, what do you pay an experienced dispatcher that is theoretically supporting and supervising those operators? When they're on the road? Um, so then, of course, you have to adjust their wage. And so as you can see, there's a there's a trickle down impact here um, that we're talking about. So it's 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 complex and not easy. Um, we would like nothing better than to extend this contract. I just, as I, I know we previously talked a month, month and a half ago. Um, and as I dug into it and, and uh, went through the, the details with Fernando, it became increasingly clear that, you know, I didn't want to put any of us in a position of committing to something that, that we were going to fail at. And um, I just did not feel comfortable going a year and a half without an adjustment in wages above and beyond, you know, what we were able to work out contractually. And um, I just, at that point, felt like I had to call Joe and have a conversation with him about where we were at. Um, we did, or I did, I asked our compensation department to do a, a analysis um, using Economic Research Institute to look at the wages for all of our different classifications and positions there in Crescent City. I shared that information with Joe and I'm sure he can share that with you folks after this meeting or at a later date, um, but it definitely confirms what our concerns are. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a snapshot basically at the low, medium and top wage for all of our different classifications. And so a little bit more of a scientific approach, um, which also confirmed where we're at. So, I mean, we want to be there for a long time. We want to be your contractor for a long time and, and um, be your partner through this process. We understand that based on the Caltran regulations and the way we're at, that the way to a successful future is likely through an RFP and, and um, we will partner with you in whatever direction you decide to go. Um, with that, if there's any questions for me, I, I appreciate it. Yeah, I have, a, I have a question. Go right ahead, Bo. So, so you, you, you say the starting wage right now is 18? 
No, is that, is that no, right? the, the starting rate right now is 16 because of the COVID um, supplements that we're getting. Oh, so the starting okay. wage in our original base pricing for the contract is actually $14 an hour for operators. We're, we're lucky there's anybody even driving right now because this to me isn't a job, it's a trade. Yes, sir. These, these folks have to go to school to, to drive a truck. They go through uh, continued education, I'm sure, to drive passengers. And, do, and their logbooks, do they keep logbooks? Um, they, a few of the drivers are, will keep logbooks. Um, yes, if, they're gonna, if there's any danger of them going over 12 hours. So I don't think we're required to in our current roles, but we have in the past there. So, so just, for, just to keep, keep, put it in perspective, a starting driver at South Coast at South Coast Lumber to start in the dump truck, which is the Class B, is twenty one ninety an hour. So, like, like I said, we're lucky we even have drivers. Uh, um, Babbage, I know they're Class A and they pay thirty percent of the load. So you're looking at almost six hundred dollars a day some days with them. And I've seen I've seen them hiring as well, so it's just something to keep in mind. I, I sixteen dollars like we're way overdue for this conversation. It sounds like. Agree. And anybody just anybody have anything else? Oh, if I could just chime in a little bit. Uh, and thank you. Go right ahead. Um, just some of the board members. Of we had some transition in board members at the start of twenty twenty one, but this was. This was an issue that the prior board was very passionate about. We talked about it at that time. We're like, let's wait till we get closer to the end of the contract. I basically had warned them that Caltrans, you know, had become a, a barrier last time we tried to intervene. So yeah, this has been a, an issue for a while um, brewing. I have a, just a quick question. Um, are you finding it difficult right now? Did you, were you able to retain your drivers through the COVID crisis? We lost half. You lost yeah. half? Yeah. Yeah, um, there, was, there was a bunch of different things that happened. Some were afraid to work. Um, there was one or two of those folks. Um, I think we did actually at one point have to let somebody go because of the reduction in work, um, who then later could have been recalled, but couldn't come back. Um, and then there's been some attrition as well. Yeah, you guys are aware of the incident we had um, a couple of months ago that led to uh, somebody leaving. Um, and uh, so I'm joking, fill you in on that if, if needed, if, if you're not, uh, Valerie. But um, yeah, so we retained about half. And the only reason we've done that is um, thanks to the $2 an hour supplement that we've gotten, I'm sure. Um, and then some of the, I mean, that's to Fernando and Nick's credit and the dispatch team, you know, having a good work environment and, and a place where people are at least comfortable and happy to work. And that does go a long way. Um, but at some point that only goes so far. So. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I think that that, um, I appreciate that because a lot of the restaurants who had to lay off people, they're, they're not able to find people now. Um, and so I just had kind of had wondered where you guys landed with regard to that. And wages are, are very vital, especially attracting new drivers, but to um, keep your experienced drivers there, we need to treat them right. And like Bo said, this is a trade and we want skilled drivers in there driving around on our, our roads and with all these passengers. So um, I'm very supportive of um, advocating strongly for, for these higher wages. That's all. Valerie. Um, well, Joe, I, there is uh, no more comments from the board. Um, and, and Tamara, being you're the, the member of the public that's listening in, if you would just jump in whenever you um, uh, feel you need to make a, a public comment, I would appreciate that. Um, just so we don't have to go in and out of public comment for every, uh, for every item. Um, so with that, being that's the discussion only um, item, we'll move on to item seven, approve resolution 
dash 21 dash 12 adjusting the fiscal year 2020 21 budget amendment number one. And Dan Heron is going to present this one for us, Darren. As Thank soon you, Dan. as Dan you do, <laughs> unmute <laughs> his uh, uh, Zoom here. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman Short. Uh, what you have here in this um, um, report is uh, a discussion of the, the current budget. We're still, we still have one month of fiscal year um, 2000, 2001. And it looks like we're going to come up shy in one of the categories, um, and, and some minor adjustments to other categories. Now, this is an annual administrative kind of a thing that that goes on. You just don't want to show overages on any line item. So the uh, accounting is fairly rigorous about uh, getting budget changes when it seems uh, eh, it's toward the end of the year, uh, but it's to, to make sure that we don't go over each uh, budget line item. The um, uh, staff report in the middle talks about the budget changes that are being requested and suggested uh, by the uh, uh, county auditor's office. And the main one, uh, most of them are just juggling between uh, uh, categories to, to uh, make sure that none of them go over. Uh, but the main one is about 157,000. That was a, a surprise to us. Um, an overage in the operations and management contract uh, Smith River to Arcata. And uh, we're still a little, uh, a little uncertain what it, uh, caused it, what caused it. It might have been the um, uh, fact that we had to adjust uh, down our, our scopes when uh, COVID hit and we were running on, on um, fewer hours for each of the runs, but it could be an uh, arithmetic error. It could be when we dig into it, we'll find out whether or not the, the invoices uh, match this and whether or not there's miscoding someplace too. But be that as it may, we'd like to adjust that out. And fortunately, we've got the money to do that. The uh, uh, TDA coming in 19% increase uh, is uh, definitely good news for us. With the staff report, you've got a, um, the resolution that we ask you to act on today and um, an adjustment sheet showing our current budget, the changes on individual line items that we'd like to make, and the sheet that we got from the uh, uh, county saying, here's what we'd like to see it come out at the end of, um, end of the fiscal year. Um, mostly administrative. Um, if you have any questions, um, I can answer them with Joe. I turn it over do, to you. <laughs> do we have any, uh, any questions from the board? Seems like it was pretty well well laid out for us here. Um, Bo, Bredette, uh, Valerie, do you guys have any questions? Um, I do, I was wondering, I know, um, was it Caltrans that has to approve any wage increases that we do? Yes. Okay, that's what I thought. It, it is. Uh, that's because uh, that's been that's an issue been there for a good long time. I think uh, they're, they're part of this process, even though it's federal. That is an interesting, yeah. an interesting thing there. So uh, we can read that report. For, yeah, we can vote for an increase, but they may not approve it. Correct. Uh, if you're talking about the wages, uh, yes. Yeah. But if yeah. you're talking about this, this is uh, an addition to our contract. Okay. However, okay. The uh, cost of the contract, they're, they're probably legitimate costs. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, so at this time, if there's no more questions, looking for a motion, if anybody is so inclined. I motion that we approve resolution 2020212, approving the RCTA fiscal year 2021 budget amendment number one to increase revenues and expenditures to make adjustments to the other line items to reflect the changed conditions. Thank you, Valerie. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Thank you, Bo. And um, with that, um, Nicole, um, would you hold the vote, please? Director Starkey? Yes. Director Roberts? Yes. Director Smith? Yes. Chairman Short? And that's a yes for me. Okay, moving right along. Um, item number eight, a discussion of approval of resolution 2020-21-13, adopting the RCTA fiscal year 2021-22 budget. Dan, are you gonna take this one too? Is Joe gonna hand it off again? <laughs> Actually, it's Joe's. Yeah, I was gonna. Uh, we're gonna thank the hand off on it. this one. Yeah, <laughs> I'll keep, I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna keep it on this one. Um, but yeah, Dan did a great job. Thank you for that last one. Um, this is our annual budget adoption. Um, you guys had a couple of preview looks at it earlier in the spring. Um, some of the highlights of this budget that are noteworthy are. Um, Indeed, what Dan talked about, the fact that the TDA funding is projected to be at an all-time high, um, which almost seems illogical, but um, you know, we've checked around and the, the auditor's office is confident. So um, we're, we're it's good news, <laughs> which is always a little, a little cautious about uh, good news that doesn't seem to compute. But um, so the TDA funding is high, so that's good. Um, that helps us to... Uh, to present this budget to you that does restore over half of the services uh, that were cut last spring. Um, so those costs are in here as well as the corrected amount from the last agenda item. We're pretty sure it was a, a math error when I was calculating the budget during the COVID pandemic a year ago. So um, it's based on the uh, current actuals. So we're confident with that, with those costs. Um, there are other projects in the budget. Um, fares, um, we know they're running very low, but one of the eligible expenses is of the federal CARES money is backfilling lost fares. So um, we put in the, where, where they should be and we'll use the COVID funds to, to do that backfill, uh, assuming that ridership stays a little low this year. Um, we have up to five uh, bus purchases in there under the capital projects section. We have, to, we have to budget for the maximum possible grants that we've applied for that could come through. Rarely do they all come through, but um, we're pretty positive at least uh, probably three or four of these will. Um, and those are federal money with local match coming from our PTMISCA, which is almost diminished. It's almost down to zero. So after this, after this year's budget, it will be pretty much depleted. Uh, it includes $20,000 capital from that same PTMISEA money, but from the facility pot, there's two, there's two pots of money under PTMISEA, buses, bus replacements and facilities. So 20,000 for facilities to continue our um, needed um, miscellaneous repairs of the facility here. Um, it includes 40,000 in funds to advance the electric bus project by uh, obtaining the uh, engineering for final design. We talked a little bit about that last month. Um, the, it includes 66,000 in funds for the planning and designing of infrastructure and location improvements near the cultural center to allow us to purchase and deploy a mobile transit center kiosk of some sort. Um, again, that, to remind the board that goal on that project is so that we can have a human presence uh, down at our most important transit stop in town. Um, which is along Front Street at Cultural Center. So we're working with the city on this one. It's a project they strongly support. Um, and, the, and Tamara uh, from the Transportation Commission has committed 26,000 in funding to help this project get moving. Uh, so then we would pony up uh, 40,000 to add to the 26 
Um, hopefully that'll be enough to uh, fund most of the improvements in the purchase of the kiosk. Uh, although it's, it's unclear, we have to decide what kind of kiosk we, we indeed want at that point. Um, the idea being that then there might be a, a, a permanent location where we can plug in the utilities. Uh, so there's some probably some utility and site improvements to be done as well um, down there along Front Street. Um, and then we kept we we, we retained our small contingency uh, to pay for major component failures, which are like engines and transmissions, which tend to with our fleet uh, tend to happen once or twice every year. So that's the same as, as we've done in the past. And then the attachment is your draft budget. Um, at that point, I'll take any questions about the budget. Thank you, Joe. Is there anybody on? I only, Actually, my only need, question was ahead. going to be about the Smith River um, Arcata inner city route, but you cleared that up. So that's, thank you for clearing that up. Good deal. Bo, you got anything for the budget? Any questions for the, uh, around the budget issue? No? And Vedette, not hear anything from you either. No, no questions. Uh, thank you. Um, well, with that, then I would uh, entertain a motion. I get to it. Hold on, I'll do it. <laughs> I'd like to make sure I'm, I say it right. I will motion that we adopt resolution 2020-21-13, approving the fiscal year 2021-2022 RCTA budget. Excellent. Thank you, Valerie. Uh, do we have a second? I'll second it. Uh, thank you, Vedette. Um, Nicole, would you pull the vote? Director Smith? Did I come through? Yes. There, there you yep. did. Thanks, Bo. Director Roberts? Yes. Director Starkey? Yes. Chairman Short? Yes. All righty. Moving right along here. Um, item nine. Sorry, I lost my place there for a second. <laughs> Approved resolution 2020-21-14, authorizing fiscal year 2021-22 Transportation Development Act claim. All right, thank you, Chair Short. Um, this item goes hand in hand with the budget. This is where most of the money comes from, at least the non-federal stuff. Uh, so this is our annual TDA claim. And as I touched on earlier, the most noteworthy thing is it's at an all time high, which is um, phenomenal considering all that we we went through as a community and as a state and a nation and, and a planet in the last year or so. Um, what are the thoughts, I, I, in case you guys are wondering how it could possibly be so strong, I've heard discussions that it might be the continued um, efficiency increases in capturing sales tax from, uh, from mail order online commerce, e-commerce. Um, I know in the old days, you almost never paid any sales tax. And nowadays, I know when I buy something, they're pretty good about capturing that. So there's very well could be a big part of how um, we can come out of this pandemic at such all time record highs. Um, so that is 860,000 in TDA, which is up by about 135 over last year an increase of 18%. Um, the STA money is down a little, and that's money from the sales tax on diesel fuel statewide. So that did drop marginally though, maybe about five, 10% from the pandemic. Uh, it was a little over 200 um, the prior year. Um, so we're claiming the maximum amount possible. And, and if we don't spend it all, which if you look at your back at your budget, it had us projecting to to have a surplus of about 300,000. So, you know, we'll see that that way if the, if the actual projections or if the actual revenues come in worse than projecting, we're not in such a precarious position. So um, that's the claim. Um, there's a lot of information in the claim. It's uh, mostly mandated by the state of California. We have a copy of our latest CHP report is in there. Our terminal inspections, we have a copy of the contract. Uh, this, that, and the other. So if you have any questions, uh, we're here to answer them. Well, thank you, Joe. Any any questions from the, the board? 
not seeing any. Yeah, it was it was a pretty comprehensive uh, little uh, presentation about the the Transportation Development Act uh, claim that we have to put in. Even the CHP reports and all was uh, was um, it, you know I didn't didn't leave any questions for me to 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 ask. That's for sure. Um, so with that, um, again, I will entertain a motion from the board if, if anybody so chooses. I'll do it again. I feel like I'm hogging the motions, but... Hey, hog, hog the motions. Go right ahead. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm going to motion that we approve resolution 2020-21-14, authorizing the submittal of the RCTA fiscal year 2021-2022. Transportation Development Act claim packet to the Del Norte Local Transportation Commission. Thank you, Valerie. Do we have a second? I have a second. Thank you, Vidette. Uh, Nicole, will you pull the board? Director Starkey? Yes. Director Smith? Yes. Director Roberts? Yes. Chairman Short. And yes, for me too. Thank you, Nicole. Okay, moving on to item 10, discussion and approval of summer 2021 service changes and the implementation timetable. I think I uh, I remember us uh, re removing these, <laughs> these items we're gonna talk about <laughs> last time I was on the board. So Joe, if you'd walk Great. us through that, I'd appreciate it. Be glad to, thank you, Chair Short. Um, yeah, we did. We did cut these uh, some of this stuff last year, um, but yeah, we don't want to cut to the end of the plot. We want to build up to it. So um, we uh, had talked about this at the at our strategic planning work session, and again briefly uh, back in May, um, considering the financial situation has improved or, or at least not deteriorated as expected in the last year, um, we felt. Um, pressure to reinstate some of the, uh, the most productive and needed services that were cut at the start of the pandemic. Um, so um, following through with that, we have identified three uh, particular items that cumulatively make up over half of what was cut, um, probably closer to 55% um, to bring back. Uh, the staff proposes to reinstate Saturday service that's the biggest chunk of hours. So we, we have, right now we're just a Monday through Friday service. So there's no mobility that we provide on the weekends. So bringing back Saturday service on all routes except 199. Uh, number two uh, would be to reinstate, uh, bring out a suspension is probably more the right word, our route 300 and add in a morning version to complement the afternoon. This is the route that Dan laughs and he hates this route, but this is the route that was created just before the pandemic to help with the school bell service to, so that we can capture more market share for uh, the high school and, and possibly the junior high. We ran it for about six months and then COVID came. So um, it was starting to succeed in 1920. And then uh, it was suspended in March of 20 when in-person lecture, in-person classes were suspended at the schools. And then we didn't bring it back last year because by the time they finally did in-person lessons, it was late in the year and folks had their commutes pretty much set. Anyway, so we project to bring that back. That's not a lot of hours, it's uh, three hours a day. So it just operates in the morning for like an hour and a half and in the afternoon for like an hour and a half. Uh, and then lastly, um, we're proposing to restore the last hour of the Crescent City local route service on weekdays. Uh, that's between 6 and 7 p.m. So when the COVID hit a year ago, we were running until 7, and then we cut that last hour uh, to right size us with the, you know, with the lockdowns and the travel restriction. So those three um, projected annually, those three in, uh, reinstatements would bring back 3,286 approximately annual revenue hours. Um, out of about the 6,000 that we, uh, we killed a year ago during the pandemic. Um, so that's the proposal on the table. Then I wanna talk about the bad news, which is at the bottom of page two. Um, you heard about our, our problems attracting um, staff and we, we, we talked about that 
Um, it's affecting our ability to promise to, to the customers that we can bring these services back on a specific day. Uh, specifically, the Saturday service on um, First Transit doesn't feel that they can do that at this point. With, they need uh, about four or five uh, new bodies, new drivers uh, to meet that, um, which is really frustrating to me, but I understand where they're coming from. I think we all get, get the picture right now. It's an extremely competitive labor market. So that is kind of a TB where we're, we're asking the board to approve that, but with an implementation date to be determined. Um, the top priority that we've I've talked with First Transit is the Route 300 will be ready and will be provided when school starts uh, in August, uh, assuming, fingers crossed, assuming for the best that we're back in classes and the kids are back in school. So that's that one we can provide for sure. Um, then the Saturday, probably the second priority might be the last hour of the evening. I'll have to talk, I'll have to confirm that with Fernando. Um, but the toughest one is that we need the most new, we need new staff in order to provide the Saturday service. So with that in mind, we're asking you to approve the service plan with the caveat that we're not going to be able to roll it all out like we would normally do in August with, you know, fanfare and celebration. We'll, we'll bring out the 300 for sure in August and the others as soon as we can get staffed up. Hopefully not, hopefully not too long after that. That sounds great, Joe. Um, yeah, totally agree with not uh, reinstating Route 199. If, if I remember correctly, when we decided to drop that, I think we only were averaging like one rider per trip. So yeah, it was that was a real easy decision to make uh, dropping dropping that one. But uh, is there any uh, any any comments or questions from the board? Well, I have one. Uh, are you planning on dropping the entire 199 for the entire week or just Saturday? No, just Saturday. Okay. Because on I, Saturday... I love it when staff shows that we never there. communicate when we ask questions like that. No, good <laughs> question. Thank, thank you for the, the clarification. Thing, just Saturday. Saturday during the summer times would be the busiest time to take that out. Yeah, because of the rafter, they're they're starting to do that again. Yep, well, I was thinking you know, I would go to like maybe operating the one ninety nine three days a week versus five days a week, and do it say Friday Saturday for sure because that implements the rafters and we get about twelve rafters each time we take them. Mm -hmm. So um, and then that would leave Monday or Wednesday open for another route. Ultimately, it's up to you guys, but I definitely would oppose bringing removing it from Saturday during the summer, at least. So is there a way that we can, because you're saying that even now to resume Saturday, we're, we're, we don't have the staff for it. Correct. So to resume Saturday for 199 for this summer is probably not going to happen. That is correct. Okay. And are you comfortable with that, Fernando? Or Yeah. Okay, so when we when we if we implement this, we're looking at now through August of next year. Correct. Okay, and you're not necessarily, Valerie. Um, we um, this year we we're looking at August for a service change, but sometimes we do the service changes earlier. So, for example, if the board and staff, if we want to roll out the summer like a summer schedule which I agree with Fernando, the 199 does its best work in the summer and, you know, including weekend, we could, we could do that service change like for June or, you know, June 1st ish if we wanted to. Um, this is just to get us going this year because we're running behind and we, you know, we don't have the staff to, to expand. We, we normally like would go for a July service change if we could, but that's not possible with staffing this year. Yeah. Do we have a, I'm sorry, do we have a particular day on that 199 where there's no or only one dry one rider that we could eliminate during the week so that we could have the Saturday? Is that well, a possibility? It, it, typically it picks up at the beginning of the month and the end of the month when everybody gets paid. Sometimes we go there and back and we don't have anybody. No, there's no, I don't believe there's a particular weekday that struggles much oh, okay. than the rest. Okay. If I could uh, mention, though, we do have a free bus program 
and veterans have been uh, really significantly uh, seen on that uh, 199. Uh, so that would be Monday through Friday normally, but I, I definitely hear both uh, Mr. Uh, Director Smith's argument that uh, Saturday is an important part of the summer. So we need to be thinking about all of them. But I think right now we need to make the changes that we can. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, and I, I understand what Fernando's saying. Um, and maybe we can discuss that once we, uh, we have, you know, the, the ability with the employees and, uh, and come back and revisit uh, reinstating that at a later time. Yeah, okay, so there any, go ahead, Valerie. Um, so as long as the, you think the school one will be up and running by the time school starts, um, the Saturday routes, with the exception of 199, we're hoping September, right? And then that last hour, when are, when are we hoping? Are we hoping for August on that too? Uh, we'd have to work with staffing. It seems like to me, the last hour would be easier than Saturday. So we might be able to deliver that first. What do you think, Fernando? Yeah, we will be able to deliver that. Uh, there will be some overtime, though. Okay. Yeah, as long as the school one is is important to me, and um, with gas prices going up, I'm just curious Fernando. to know if we're going to see more people with the longer distance trying to do the commute. I'm just I'm curious to know if that's going to happen. I don't know, but um, but no, I think that looks great. And with that, I can approve that the staff, I'll make a motion to approve the staff recommend that August 2021 service changes to be implemented as staffing allows. Thank you, Valerie. Do we have a second? I'll second it. <laughs> Thank you, Vedette. Uh, Nicole, would you poll the vote, please? Director Smith? Yes. Director Robert? Yes. Director Starkey? Yes. Chairman Short? And yes for me. Okay, moving on to item 11. Uh, discussion of upcoming projects. SRTP mini update electric bus yard design and cultural center transit hub. All right, thank you, Chair Short. This will be quick. Right. I um, wanted right. to just touch base with you guys on these three projects that we'd like to take on this, this fiscal year coming up. Uh, the first one we haven't talked much about, but with the, the planner in me, which was what I did before I had to become a manager, um, the, the world's changed so much since the pandemic, and we have a rare opportunity where we reduced a lot of service and rather than necessarily throw everything that used to run out there back into place, uh, it's a unique opportunity to take a new look at what we do, um, update all our financial projections, you know, do a little digging and verifying that can we count on, for example, the, the robust TDA that's come out of the uh, pandemic. Is that something we can, you know, bank on going forward? Some of those things and update our capital project needs. So um, what we used to do in the Bay Area a long time ago when I was working down there, we used to do a mini short range transit plan update every year down there we did it because things do change and they certainly changed in the last year here. Um, so we only get funded for our full SRTP about every four or five years. And we just did one, it seems like a thousand years ago, but it was uh, adopted in early 19. So it, we, it was about two years ago we adopted it. Two to three years ago, we did the work that went into it. Uh, but still, a lot of it has been rendered obsolete by what's what, what's went down with the pandemic and all. So uh, especially uh, if we could do a small consultant contract, I'm looking at about a 25K budget to update the service plan. We could take a good look at like, for example, this 199 situation um, that emerged in this discussion, some great ideas. And it does seem to be better fit for like a seasonal route for at least five or six days a week, perhaps seasonal, then in the winter, it really does quiet down. Uh, so maybe we pair it back. Um, that's something we didn't get in the last SRTP, but it sure would be nice to take a look at that now. As well as um, chapter seven 
uh, helped us launch our CTSA, which is our Consolidated Transportation Service Agency stuff. And we got two projects off the ground from that, uh, from the 2019 plan. We got the ADA eligibility evaluation going and then the transit travel training. Now, both of which have been totally hamstrung by the pandemic, but still we got them going. Um, but now it looks like with this uh, enhanced level of TDA money that's flowing through to the agency, we probably can afford to do an, a third or a fourth project. So there's something else, you know, we want to look at, uh, take a closer look at some additional CTSA activities that we could maybe perform for the community, being as the budget looks a little more ro robust than we ever thought before. Um, and then, yeah, back to uh, updating the financial plan and taking a look at our services against like the performance standards and a fresh look at our stats. Not that they're going to be pretty uh, from the last year or two, but we, we should take a fresh look at them. So that's what that project's about. If the board would support it, um, we can talk about which order we do it in. Um, we sort of made our call for what to roll out uh, to bring back this fall. So we probably could do that later in the winter. It just needs to be done by the time we get in the next spring of 2022, because um, then there's an, you know, another window to change services. Um, so that's one of the, plan, the projects I'd like to undertake sometime during the, during the winter, perhaps. Um, the electric bus project, um, you guys may recall, we were able to apply for and get free pro bono planning assistance. They got us uh, a planning document uh, about our electric bus program, things we would need, uh, things to consider. And there are still, still plenty of open questions from that, no, que no doubt about it. But uh, we learned a lot. And the next step is we need to certainly get our yard and our electrical service upgraded here so we can charge buses overnight. That was one of the recommendations from the planning project is we look at the, I think they call it tier two, but the slow overnight charging would be the most appropriate and affordable for us. Um, so for that, you need to sort of trench infrastructure, put the charging stations in. We're going to need to upgrade our transformer. We're gonna to need to work closely with Pacific Power. And uh, so it's a construction project basically. So this would provide the uh, final design and bid a biddable set of plans for that project. Um, and this is not an expense that would need to kind of come out of our general budget, our TDA money, because our LC top funds that are dedicated to the electric bus, they do not allow engineering as part of the ineligible expenditure. So this would be to uh, get a small engineering firm on board to help us um, get a set of plans designed so that we're ready to, ready to build the electric bus charging infrastructure maybe in the following fiscal year. Um, oh, and then third and last one is what we touched on it a little bit earlier, the idea of how we could get a more personalized, customer-friendly, uh, staffed experience down at the cultural center um, to both open up opportunities for past sales, ticket sales, um, security, keeping an eye on, on the transfer environment down there, um, just to, to be a little bit more of a high profile down there. Um, so that project, um, we originally started by looking at leasing some space within the cultural center building, but it doesn't seem like that's the preferred option of the city. They would prefer to find us a permanent uh, appropriate location near there for like a uh, daily staffed kiosk that could be moved out of there because it is a coastal inundation zone. So there's a, a lot of building restrictions in that area. Um, but uh, so this project, and as I mentioned earlier, it's got some seed funding from Tamara at the DNLTC, and we would augment it with uh, up to 40,000 to hopefully purchase the kiosk itself uh, once we've identified the needed utility connections and location. I'll take any questions. That sounds great. Uh, any, any questions from the board? So did you did you meet with the uh, city about that? Is, is that where that re part of the re from Eric Weir or or with the uh, met well, with John met with John Olson like three times about it. We talked a few days John. ago again. Yeah, John's on board and with it. And uh, in fact, he was in one of the meetings with Tamara as well. Eric, I think knows about it, but he hasn't been in the meeting. So. All right, thank you. Joe, what is your order of priority, or is it is it kind of 
center around weather. <laughs> um, good point. Most of these really could go either way. Um, I was thinking that um, I was thinking that we maybe um, go first with the um, the kiosk, the cultural center transit hub project, and then the uh, mini SRTP, and then the uh, the electric bus engineering third. But I'm open to whatever uh, whatever the board thinks or some combination thereof. Yeah, that's uh, no, that's just exactly what I was thinking. Um, the electric buses were not going to get one for what was it? Another two years? Is that is that correct? Probably, probably yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I I don't imagine that you need us to to dictate your order of priority for sure, but um, but those uh, those sound like great uh, great ideas to to uh, better the operation, especially that kiosk down down on Front Street. Yeah, that's yeah, an exciting kiosk. How do we plan on manning that? You're going to be down there, Fernando. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to surprise that'll keep Fernando. Your last <laughs> no, seriously, it, uh, it's going to need to be basically a mobile, a mobile dispatch center. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I I just want to put in my two cents, and again, I'm with uh, Darren that we don't necessarily want to dictate your priorities. But the electric bus one to me is that we're going to have to get there. So I would love to take our baby steps and start making sure that we're doing what we can while we do have a little extra um, funding to you know get that kind of set up and because it's going to be mandated on us at some point. We're going to have to get there. So I would like to just make sure that we keep that hovering um, at the top of our priorities. Thank you, Val, for that. All right. I guess if there's no other comments or questions, we will, that was a discussion only. Uh, yes. Uh, we will move on to um, item 12, operations report. Fernando, you're up. We got one new driver. She went into revenue service last Monday, and then we plan on hiring one more dispatcher. We recently promoted one of our dispatchers to safety manager, um, and then uh, one of our dispatchers will go to lead dispatcher to fill those positions. So hopefully that all goes smoothly in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we have some facility work that's been done on the yard here. The side of the building that's been rusted has been replaced and we're waiting on the beam to be replaced next and some gutter work as well. So that's what I have for the uh, location here at First Transit. Very good, Fernando, thank you. Yep. Um, general manager's report then. Uh, normally I just skip this. This one I'll give you a real short report because um, there was one item that didn't fit into the others too good but we wanted to, to tell you guys about it. Um, we continue to participate in this far north transit group, which is comprised of the transit agencies. I think we're about the northernmost, but then Trinity, there, there's others and they, all the way down as far as Sonoma County and um, uh, on the south end uh, that share the 101 corridor and over to the five corridor. So it's a very interesting and, and fruitful group. We meet about every other Monday for Zoom calls. It started during the pandemic. But one of the projects that's um, had its genesis from that, it's starting to roll, is this, um, the state of California, Caltrans has a group called Cal ITP. It's, oh, what does ITP mean? Um, Integrated Payment System. Transit Payment System, okay. right, exactly. And, and their project is, they've uh, selected our group and we've volunteered happily to be part of it. Um, to do a trans uh, st a fair standardization and a real time transit uh, project um, that would bring Google Transit real time to Google Maps. So for now, like right now earlier, I was playing with it. You can go into Google Maps, and uh, if you select Transit as your mode, you can do a trip plan for here in here in Del Norte um, to get yourself around. Our stuff's in there. But what isn't in there is the real-time uh, adjustment to the schedule. Like your bus, 
maybe the print schedule says your bus should be here in two minutes, but maybe it's seven minutes behind and that really should say nine minutes. And that's the level that we're not at right now um, that the Cal ITP project will help us get to. So they'll get all of the participants onto Google Transit real time, which requires, you know, I don't wanna to get too technical in the conversation, but we're gonna to need to either upgrade or switch our AVL CAD provider, which is our system that the fixed route buses currently use that tells it like it's up in dispatch right now. I see it in the other room that shows you where the bus is at what its status is, whether it's late, who's driving it, that sort of thing. Um, so the current provider we have that we, you know, this is our first one. We had no toys like this before. We've had this for about three years with double map. Currently it doesn't provide the re real time feed. It won't export it. So we, we've approached them through First Transit because First actually bought it and provided it for us as part of the contract. We're trying to get them to upgrade to be able to provide this information is should that fail and we need to find out pretty soon then we're going to have to switch providers and that might be that's something we could do as part of the new contract that we're looks like we're heading towards later this year we could specify a provider that has uh, a system that provides and exports gtfs rt so that's an exciting project and the second half of that kind of the more difficult but but exciting part of it is they're looking at a um, onboard contactless fare payment system so folks can use their plastic, your Visa MasterCard, and just tag the bus reader when you get in, no more carrying exact cash. Uh, and then the fare, but it requires cooperation and a clearinghouse, so we're going to need to work together with the other agencies. Uh, and then additionally, then um, fares could be capped and transfers could be made free, so there's a lot of exciting stuff that could come from it. But uh, so there's uh, probably going to be, a, if it's something the board wants us to proceed with, we'll probably be bringing an MOU, an memorandum of understanding to the board later this summer or early fall, I'm guessing, that'll outline how the, the group will play together and how the projects will be rolled out. But uh, so, yeah, that's really exciting because that's one of the major, um, you know, barriers we constantly hear is, oh, why can't we just pay with our credit card? And there's reasons why you can't, but this would overcome that. Uh, and with the Cal ITP project helping a lot, it won't be really expensive for us to do it either. So that's exciting. I think that well, sounds that great. We'll see on, you, is that something we'll see on a future agenda? Because that that is definitely going to appeal to the younger crowd. Yeah, yeah. It's something that you might even see at our next meeting or the meeting after that. Yeah. Right on. Yeah, that sounds great. Any other any other comments or questions from the board? All right, is there any announcements? Anybody got anything good to, to announce for the, for um, the group? I just want to thank Fernando for uh, participating in our local 4th of July parade. I think it's great publicity. I'm glad that you see uh, that you signed up for that. Um, so I just, I'm, I don't know if you're gonna decorate your bus or not, but I am excited that you guys decided to be part of the community event and participate. So I wanted to just put that out there. You're welcome. Right, right on, oh, thanks Valerie. Awesome. We haven't done that for a long time. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna have a booth and uh, we're gonna have two vehicles in the parade or is it one, Fernando? Just one. Just one vehicle in the parade. Then we've got a booth and Sylvia Martinez Palacios you guys met her recently. She's our new marketing uh, staff member. She's going to be there along with uh, Aline and our Fernando maybe later. So yeah, we're going to have a staff presence at the booth as well. Oh, Good awesome. Deal. And uh, congratulations on the new driver. I know it's tough to get them. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Well, all right, all. Um, with that, I guess... I will adjourn this meeting until the next uh, board meeting that will be on Monday, August 30th at 5.15. All right. All right. Joe, if, Bye, everybody. Joe if, you, if you wouldn't mind staying on for just a second while everybody else signs off, I just got a quick question for you, Joe. Okay. Val, Val you might want to stay on too. But we'll see, see the rest of you later. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Uh, okay, yeah, everyone, have a good evening. I'm going to go ahead and close the recording off unless it's something that... Uh,
probably sounds like it's not the regular agenda. 